This is Agriculture Today, and I'm Shelby Varner with the K-State Radio Network. K-State veterinarian Greg Hanselcheck kicks off today's show by discussing bovine leukemia virus, also referred to as BLV. He explains its concerns and how common it is in dairy and beef cattle herds. Continuing the show are Kansas grain sorghum growers Brant Peterson and John Burning as they provide a look into how their crop performed this year and what they hope for next season. Greg Eyestone, Riley County Extension horticulture agent, ends the show providing tips for removing fallen leaves from the home landscape and explaining why fall is a good time to soil test. That and more is coming up ahead. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and we start our Thursday show discussing bovine leukemia virus, also commonly referred to as BLV, with K-State Veterinarian and Kansas State's Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory and K-State's College of Veterinary Medicine, Greg Hanselcheck. Greg, thanks for joining us today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Greg, as we begin our conversation around bovine leukemia virus, or as we'll commonly refer to it as BLV, first wanting to establish what it is. Well, it's a BLV, bovine leukosis virus. It's a virus that we think about it as a a virus that causes tumors in cattle. How many herds might have BLV and not even know it? Well, this is is probably going to knock some socks off here, but there was a national study on dairies in 2018, and they estimated that 94.2% of all dairy herds are positive, meaning they have at least one animal that has this virus. Dr. Sean Huser in the College of Veterinary Medicine here at K-State did a really cool study about three years ago in eastern Kansas where he looked at cow-calf operations, and he estimated that 95.9% of the cow-calf herds, at least in eastern Kansas, have at least one cow with this virus circulating in their system. Well, it's everywhere. I mean, that that's the thing. It is everywhere. So something of concern for dairy and beef cattle producers? Absolutely, it is. When we talk about this, how might someone be able to see it or what does it show up as? Yeah, so that's a great great question. So any age of animal can, can become infected, but the clinical signs are typically not going to show up in animals under four years of age. They can be younger, but typically it's four or five, six-year-old animals. And it presents itself, the fact that it can put tumors in any organ whatsoever. So any organ system can be affected. A lot of times, one of the favorite places for it to build a tumor is in the spinal cord. So a lot of, some of the times, the, the presenting sign is an animal that can't get up in the back end. They're paralyzed back there. But we can have congestive heart failure. We can have other things also. One of the common signs that in veterinary medicine, we call it ADR, which is ain't doing right. It's just a cow here and there that just is thinner than normal, and we just can't figure out what the heck's going on with her. She doesn't have any other obvious signs. A lot of times, because this virus attacks white blood cells, the positive animals, will their immune systems will not be functioning appropriately. And some of those leave the, er, the herd earlier be, because of other diseases. And so it kind of presents its, its way in that, in that sense. Sometimes are the tumors like outward facing on the outside of the livestock? Occasionally you can have them where they're subcutaneous and you'll see lumps and bumps in there. And it does present like that. But typically it's going to be internal is where it's going to be. Another clinical sign is if you have a cow that has a normal looking eye but it's actually out out of the socket. It's pushed out of the socket away, so it looks kind of like a frog. That's a classical sign that we've got a bovine leukemia cow, and the tumor's behind the eye in the socket actually pushing the eye out. It doesn't look like a pink eye. The eye looks normal. It's just not in the place that it should be. Can cattle have BLV but not even have any signs? Absolutely, and that's great. another great point. Less than 5% is our estimate of the cows that have this virus will ever show up with tumors. Now, there was an older study, I think it was done like eight years ago, where they looked at 8 million coal beef cows that went through slaughter plants. And BLV, the tumors, were the second most common reason these animals were condemned 
after they were hanging in the slaughter plant. So we say less than 5% have clinical signs, but if we could actually look inside the cows, there's a heck of a lot more than 5% that are actually have these presenting signs of tumors. How does this get from one cow to another? It's a blood-borne disease. So these viruses have to live in white blood cells. So the only way it can be spread is, is taking positive or blood from a positive cow into a negative cow. So needles are the biggest way in most herds, but it can also be palpation sleeves. We know that uh, less than one one one-hundredth of a drop of blood is enough blood to transmit this virus. So palpation sleeves, there's enough blood sometimes on those to pass it to the next cow. So, and then uh, tattoo pliers, ear taggers, anything that's a needle can, can spread this disease. And then uh, through the milk and the colostrum, and it can also be spread that way. And then uh, typically not through reproduction. That's one of the biggest questions I get is that if, even though it could occur, it's, it's not really on our list of the way that it's spread. So, and then the last way is some flies, and particularly the horse fly. It can also spread this disease. So no ticks when it comes to spreading BLV? No, it's it's a, it's really weird, but it's not like anaplas where ticks are a primary player. Ticks are not involved with BLV transmission. Is there anything producers can do for treatment? There is no treatment. Uh, bovine medicine, we have no antivirals. And so we just know that if we have a virus in the herd, regardless of what it is, we're just going to have to ride it out. How should people test for this? Well, that's a great question. So there's a, a couple blood tests that people can, can test for. And one, one looks for the antibody and one actually looks for the virus. The thing about this is once an animal becomes infected, they will be lifelong carriers. They, they will not recover on their own. And again, there's no treatment. So the way to see if the animal is positive would be a blood test. And then from there... Some of the management things we can do, uh, we talk about test and culling. So we find everybody that's positive, we send those to slaughter, and we have a clean herd. The problem is a lot of herds that we deal with, 60 to 70 plus animals are positive within the herd. And producers know they can't sell 70% of their cows. So that is not typically one of the management things that we talk very much about. Segregation, we have herds that segregate, so they test the herd put the positive animals together and, and keep the negative animals together, and they run them that way. And they only have to keep them separated during the fly season. During the winter time, there's no flies, and if we're changing needles, changing sleeves, and doing those kind of things, then we're, we're not going to spread the disease. The downside of that is that you're going to have to test the negatives for the next several years because some of those are not negative, and some of those will go from negative to positive. So... People that segregate, they're going to have to retest their negatives multiple years in a row. When it comes to testing and blood testing, is it sometimes worth looking into the level of BLV in the blood? That's a really good question. Yeah, One of the uh, neat and recent strategies is to actually uh, just to look at how much virus each animal is carrying. Some really good research out of Michigan State has shown that animals that have a very low level of viruses in their system, they really don't put everybody else in the herd at risk of becoming infected. So the way this this works is that you blood test everybody and you target those with the highest virus load. And those are the ones that you call. And there's there's herds in Michigan that have done this and within about four years they showed that the the number of animals within the herd went went down uh, tremendously and there really wasn't much spread after that time. So that's a new strategy that we're trying in some herds. I know that Dr. Huser in the College of Veterinary Medicine, he's, he's uh, doing that in some of his herds in eastern Kansas too. So that's another possibility. When you mention testing and it being able to be transferred from colostrum, is it testing all your oldest cows even to your young calves from that year? So we typically aren't going to test animals less than six months of age because they could have maternal antibodies to this to this disease, but yeah, we're gonna we're gonna typically gonna test everybody from six months of age on to get the positives out of there or segregate them as we can. And producers listening know know that segregation or culling in those cases is not all that realistic. And as we're thinking about BLV and obviously not something great for cattle herds, anything humans you need to be concerned about? Yeah, there's a little bit of a drumbeat out there that suggests that. 
this virus has been associated with human mammary tumors. And there's been a couple cases where they're able to find virus particles. I don't believe they've ever found live virus in some, in some human mammary tumors that are actually bovine leukemia virus. The studies that I've, that I've seen where they compared people that were around positive cows versus people that were around negative cows, there was no difference in, in cancer rates in each one of those populations. But again, there's that little bit of a drumbeat saying that maybe this virus is associated with human tumors. If people are just hearing about BLB for the first time and the cattle producer wants to get their herd into getting tested and checking it out, what's your recommendation for getting started? Well, talk to their local veterinarian, number one, and then see whether they need to they need to look at this and need to control it. A lot of that depends on whether they're commercial or purebred. Or For me, I like to start to see how much is in the herd, so that takes a little bit of testing. You don't have to test the whole herd. If there's a low amount, you can cull those. If they're absolutely a high amount, then you just do some of the management strategies we talked about. So that's the first place I'd start. Greg, I appreciate you taking the time to join us today. You bet. That was K-State Veterinarian in Kansas State's Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory and K-State's College of Veterinary Medicine, Greg Hanselchak. You can check out Kansas State's Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory at ksvdl.org. Again, that is ksvdl.org. I will link it in today's show notes on actoday.net. We're cutting to a short break now on agriculture today, but when we come back, we'll be joined by two Kansas grain sorghum growers as they discuss how their crop looked this year and what they're looking forward to for the next season. We're now cutting to that short break. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and we continue our Thursday show talking with two Kansas grain sorghum growers about how their crop looked this year and what they're looking forward to. And we begin with Brant Peterson from Johnson, Kansas. Brant, thanks for joining us today. Hey, I'm super happy to be here. Brant, as we begin talking about grain sorghum and what it looked like for you, can you tell us the scope of grain sorghum in your operation? Sure. Sorghum is an important leg of our operation. So uh, as a dryland farmer in, in extreme southwest Kansas, we have kind of the three legs. We've got wheat, sorghum, and corn. And, uh, of course, fallow fits in there, but fallow doesn't pay that well, so, so we, ha- we don't call it a leg. But sorghum is one of those legs, and uh, it's, it's great for expanding out your workload by time because it goes in after corn and it comes out after corn. It's also great for managing the lower rainfall areas. And uh, for my operation, we grow some food-grade sorghum that we market through New Life Market in Scott City. Uh, We grow sorghum silage that gets fed to the local uh, heifer yards and dairies out here, which has been been growing exponentially. The the other big factor is is sorghum uses roughly a third less water of other crops. And so it's, you know, it's got the tagline, the resource conserving crop. The ethanol plants like sorghum because there's some premiums for ethanol from sorghum. So it's, it's a great fit, even though uh, currently we're, we're sorghum is behind in the basis quite a ways, which has a lot to do with the export market. But uh, I'm pretty proud to be part of the Kansas Sorghum Commission and part of the team that grows the sorghum for the largest sorghum producing state in the nation. As you are all the way in the very corner of southwest Kansas, what was your growing season like? Well, what I've been telling people is uh, the crop we have right now is about 200 percent better than what I thought I would have in April. Um, we were, you know, not much moisture in the ground and uh, not much moisture for planting. For, we have subsoil moisture or planting moisture. And then somewhere in May, we start catching a few rains. Crops got in, the crops got off to a decent start. But then, you know, hit or miss, and then the 100 degree, the week of, of wind and 100 degrees really took its toll on things. And so, I mean, I'm, I'm hearing guys 100 bushel yields, 70 bushel yields. I'm hearing guys with 25 bushel yields because, uh, and, and I've got a, I've got two fields that were a mile apart that are going to be 30 bushel difference in yield, and they're in the exact same rotation, planted to the exact same variety at, at one day apart. It's all about did a rain come on that field at a certain time and miss the other field. So it's it's very hit and miss. We we really need some 
some subsoil moisture recharge out in this country. What has the quality looked like? The quality's been good. Uh, one of the great things about being an arid climate in the fall is the grain quality stays very high. Um, the test weights have been good for the most part because most of the sorghum matured before the, the little freeze that came through. And we still, to this point, have, had, have not had a hard-killing frost, which our normal freeze date's October 15th. So it's, it's been a normally warm this fall, and uh, which, you know, every, every year's a little different. This year just happens to be that way. But uh, it's, the quality's good because rain in the fall really affects the grain quality of sorghum. And Brant, what are some important things you feel like you've learned this year? Well, I don't know. I don't know. It's hard to say what I've learned this year, but I've reinforced more things about, you know, keeping your fields clean. Um, well, this year was interesting because we didn't have, uh, I guess, a wheat crop the previous uh, summer. And so we had a wheat crop this summer, but the previous summer there was no wheat from basically here to Lubbock, Texas. And uh so we didn't, we got out of rotation, which I mean our, our wheat fallow sorghum rotation, there was no wheat stubble. So we didn't get to plant back into wheat stubble this year. And that just reaffirms of how much I love planting back into wheat stubble because it's a whole lot easier to manage the, the weed. There's usually more moisture there versus having to go back into a row crop. Everything works a lot better. So that just reinforces what I already knew is I really like growing sorghum or, or corn in standing wheat stubble and no-tilled into wheat stubble. What are you excited for as you look into your next growing season and next season of grain sorghum? Well, I was telling my wife a month ago as we drove, you know, county to county out here going to different events and different things, is as I see all the wheat stubble around that people have been chem following, I'm like, man, I'm super excited. It's going to be a great row crop here next year. Now, that, you know, from my mouth to God's ears, who knows, but at least we have the wheat stubble to plant back into, and that's exciting. You know, if you're not somewhat optimistic, you're not ever going to make it as a farmer. So at, at this point, we're dry, and it, and the wheat the wheat crop is not looking great at this point. But, hey, all we need is some winter moisture and a little luck, and we'll pull it off. Brant, I appreciate you taking the time to join us today. Hey, I'm happy to do it and uh, look forward to doing it in the future. That was Brant Peterson, who is a Kansas grain sorghum grower from Johnson, Kansas. We continue our segment, now being joined by Kansas grain sorghum grower John Burning from Scott City, Kansas. John, thanks for joining us today. Hi, Shelby. Thanks for having me. John, what is the scope of grain sorghum within your operation? Well, Shelby, we grow about, you know, it differs yearly, but between 6,000 and 9,000 acres of sorghum a year. John, is grain sorghum something you then have in a crop rotation for your operation? Oh, it is. We usually farm wheat, milo, and corn uh, and rotate. Really, it depends. You know, half the farm gets the wheat drilled back into the corn stalks and half of it goes to summer fallow. As we look at this past growing season, what did it look like for yourself in Scott City and the others around you? Well, in the beginning, it looked very challenging and continued to be that way throughout the year. You know, just seemed to hang on in in western Scott County, eastern uh, Wichita County. It was a little better over there because we just received more rain there. Eastern Scott County, where we just finished up, a little tougher, but... You can definitely see where it rained. We had some good yields there as well. And when you say good yields, what are those looking like, John? Upwards and a little over the 150 bushel acre. We've had everything from roughly 70 bushels on up to 150. So um, it's a wide range, but, you know, you definitely see where it rains. Are you pretty impressed with the quality that you're receiving? Uh, Yeah, overall with With the harvest, the quality has been great. You know, it's been very surprising that we were able to get into the field when we did. I had a conversation with a guy this morning about how, you know, this right now is normal time to be harvesting. And they are finished, and we are, I would say, 90 to 95 percent done. What are some things you've seen from this past year that you want to take on into the next growing season? Gosh, that's that's a very good question. What a guy would really like to see is rain in western Kansas. Makes things way easier. 
But, you know, some of the different varieties that, you know, K-State's working on, and being a grain sorghum commissioner, we get to see or hear a little bit about these things early on with CSIP and everything. So they've got a lot of good things coming, but I don't know that we can get them here fast enough. Like for the for the Palmer, Amaranth, um, and the Milo, that, that's really the main the main challenge in all this because we found workarounds for for everything else. Now it's just the Palmer that that we've got to contend with. Um, another one would be, you know, we we planted a lot of, um, you know, we planted around a thousand acres of Ensign Milo, and we need to give that another shot and see, you know, just how it's going to fit on our farm. What is that Ensign Milo that you mentioned, John? That's a Pioneer a Corteva product where you can spray um, like the Johnson grass and the Volunteer Milo and keep it at bay. We we used it on, let's see, we used the Ensign Milo on fields where we were Milo last year. Whenever we had failed wheat last year, we planted it to Milo. And so we were just kind of trying to even up some rotations. And so we wanted to check out the ends in Milo and see how it would handle things. You know, some some were good and others were, you know, just kind of made to scratch your head. John, anything else related to grain sorghum that you'd like to share? You know, it's, it's a grain sorghum in western Kansas is such a great fit. I was listening to your program last week, and you had a couple of counties that had, you know, they were five bushel an acre. Their, you know, their yields weren't near as good as what we have, and I think we have possibly less rain than they do in eastern Kansas in some of those spots, and yet the climate out here allows us to produce great milo. John, I appreciate you taking the time to join us today. Sure. Thank you, Shelby. That was John Burning, who is a Kansas grain sorghum grower from Scott City, Kansas. If you'd like to learn more about Kansas grain sorghum, a great way to do that is by checking out Kansas Grain Sorghum's website. You can find it by going to ksgrainsorghum.org. Again, that is ksgrainsorghum.org. I will link it in today's show notes on agtoday.net. We're cutting to a short break in just a moment, but when we come back from the break, we'll be joined by K-State horticultural agent from Riley County, Greg Eyestone, as he talks about tips for falling leaves and why fall is a great time for soil testing. We're now cutting to that short break. This is Agriculture Today. Along with Shelby Varner, I'm Jeff Wickman. As leaves continue to fall from the trees, blanketing lawns and landing in flower beds, gutters, and the curb, we need a plan for removing them from those areas. Riley County Extension Horticulture Agent Greg Eyestone says too many fallen leaves can prevent sunlight from reaching the lawn. However, if they're mulch, they can provide much-needed nutrients to the lawn and garden. Greg, it seems like we always turn around and there's more leaves on the ground, and it especially happened over this last weekend. But there are some things that we need to think about in terms of leaves. It is important to get some of those off the lawn. It is. You want to have some sunlight reaching the plant tissues, uh, particularly if we have a cool season lawn that's still kind of actively growing to a certain degree. So we do want to have some sunlight getting to those grass leaves. So if you have tree leaves covering that up, that's not necessarily a good thing. So we can just go ahead and chop those up. Don't need necessarily a mulching mower blade, just your regular blade. You may have to go over it a couple times. But as long as the the turf, the cool season grass is getting some sunlight, we're doing fine. Just continue to chop those leaves up as we get more and more through the fall. And uh, you can leave those on the lawn. They're not going to cause really any problem as far as compaction or anything like that and actually add some nutrients back into the soil. So in the long run, it's very beneficial to uh, leave tree leaves on the lawn and just chop them up. I think one of the things you're saying, though, is do this routinely. Don't wait until you've got a three or four inch layer. That's correct. We want that sunlight getting to the turf. And so you may have to do it periodically, continue maybe once a week. 
and uh, get those leaves chopped up. We want to make sure uh, those leaves are being utilized. So if uh, you get them in the gutter or on the hardscapes, uh, the sidewalk curb, you know, that is nutrients. It's beneficial to our, our plant growth and probably not beneficial to our water systems. And so if you can get those either raked up and chopped up or some way get them out of the gutter and utilized, it's free resource as far as nutrients. Now, sometimes we have more leaves than we think uh, the lawn should handle, and uh, there's lots of other uses for those tree leaves after you chop them up, which is going to you know reduce the amount that you have. Work them into the vegetable garden, flower garden. You can put them into a compost uh, system if you want. Many uh, municipalities probably have a drop-off area where you can take them for free and be utilized, maybe made into compost for the community. This is also a good time to think about maybe doing a soil test just to make sure where you stand. Yeah, basically any time the ground's not frozen or too wet or too dry, we should do a soil test. Oftentimes we recommend uh, if you're starting a new project, whether it be in the springtime, that we go ahead and do the soil sampling, have the test results, adding the tree leaves may be a, a resource that's necessary for our soils. But the soil test is going to indicate what the nutrient capacity of your soil is and whether you need to make some adjustments. Oftentimes, at least here in my area, we have a little higher pH than a lot of our plants need. And so usually the recommendation is adding some sulfur to the soil and working that in. That's not a quick fix. So that's something that would like to be done ahead of time before you do your planting. So maybe even six months ahead of time is not a bad time if your soil needs some sulfur or lime to be added so that uh, it's ready to go for spring growth. When we're doing the soil sample, we want to take that from a few different locations. Yeah, so if you're soil sampling, let's say a vegetable garden, uh, may want to do that by itself because you've done some soil preparation, some changes there. You take some random samples out of there, 10 or so, and mix them into a bucket. And as far as a soil lab, at least at Kansas State University, they'd like two cups of your soil. If you're doing the lawn, you may want to do the lawn separate than, uh, let's say, the flower bed or maybe the front yard or the backyard separately. Or maybe if you think you have a trouble spot, then you'd sample that particular location and maybe compare it with an area that's doing well to see if there's a soil issue or maybe it's some environmental stress. Is it easier to start with the extension office and have them send it in or do it yourself? I would really recommend you contact your local extension office to get the information on how to do it properly and how to package it. Many of the soil places will have different suggestions on how to gather it. And also there are some cost benefits by going through your local office as well. So check those all out. And also uh, if you've ever been to the K-State Soil Lab, they have technicians, they have lots of equipment, expensive equipment, and it's going to give you some very good results for your soil sampling. That's K-State Research and Extension Horticulture Agent for Riley County, Greg Eyestone, with tips for removing fallen leaves and conducting a soil test. And that'll do it for this edition of Agriculture Today. For Shelby Varner, I'm Jeff Wickman. This is the K-State Radio Network.